This is not about humans. <laughs> it's about our star, you know, and the fact that without that star, there's nothing for us as, as biology, as humans. Um, so just pausing to be grateful to it uh, and its relationship with, with water. And also, thank you for coming. Thank you for blessing us with your company in our home uh, and our observation of. Uh, uh, five decades um, laying down beside each other at night to sleep. And a couple other things thrown in there too. I'm so thankful to both Duncan and Melanie mm. for being such, such long-term friends. Um, we've known each other for 40 some odd years. years. Like um, and the and the, we don't even feel that old, right? No, we so, don't. Oh my God. <laughs> we don't. We aren't. We're just getting younger. Um, and just the love um, and care that they have taken of me mm. for the last seven, 11 months since I lost my husband, mm. my dear husband, who was here last July. Um, and Same it was here. his last trip. We went home and he died eight days later. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was a really um, special time for us all. Um, and the fact that Duncan and Melanie opened their home up and their hearts to so many people. You were truly two of the most special people I know. Mm, I love you. you so very much. Mm. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I had discovered a, a, a file of my writing. Anyway, this is an insight into the the time that we spent living in Nesquen Valley in 1974 as two people trying to figure out if they wanted to converge their lives together. You know, uh, and it's called the Tree of Life. Um, the, the opening <coughs> quote is from the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm only going to do excerpts, so don't worry, it looks really long, it's not. <laughs> Three laws govern life. The law of growth, 
the law of expansion, and the law of intensity. All three are illustrated by the tree of life, showing how the tree grows, how it spreads its foliage, and how it sinks its roots deep into the soil. You must be firmly rooted. Such is the first law. Then grow and assert yourself. At this moment, open yourself, stretch out your arms to feel your radiation around you, and then bring the universe back to you with your head held high, for it touches the sun. Be deep, wide, tall, truly a tree of life. The Roots. The morning came, such as the night, quietly, the light welling up from the east and the waking sounds coming with it, rolling over the surrounding hills into the valley. Mingled with these first morning sounds came the soft movements of a man. He had come early to the valley, up from the sea, and stretching out behind him were his footsteps, black holes in the glistening meadow full of dew. Spiderwebs hung from the drooping grasses, slowly turning invisible as the sun burnt their night's moisture away. Up the valley, a meadow had just awoken with the sound of birds everywhere, mingling with the busy noise of rapids, and it was towards this meadow that the man moved, following the creek farther and farther into the hills. The first blowing wind had just come against the trees that rimmed the meadow when the man rounded a bend of the narrow valley and came within sight of its green grass. He approached it carefully, dropping down into an old part of the creek bed which was blanketed with tall yellow sennet grass. Walking up and down, he examined everything, seemingly searching for a special place amongst the life around him. Ahead, the creek swirled into a calm, deep pool, and between it and the meadow grew some tall alders, their roots in the forest, but their branches reaching far out into the clearing. Just outside this canopy was a small flat area, and into this the man walked, and near the center stopped. The sounds of morning were reaching their peak now, and the sun was over the trees, burning down brightly. Life seemed to surge at that moment, and in the man's eyes was a great love for all he saw. And then he sat down into the grass, closed his eyes, and drew all these beautiful sounds and smells into him, and growing inside him was the thought of this place as his home. He went away after a while, following the creek's flowing motion back into the sea, but, but the day that had just begun would be the last before the balance of life in the meadow would include man. One afternoon, as the man and woman lay resting beside their bed, a wind grew outside, and as they glanced upwards, three leaves, one by one, drifted in through the smoke flaps. On the edges of each, spreading inwards, was the yellow of autumn. Together they rose and walked out of the teepee to watch the wind blow and the day carry on, and in amongst the green of the forest there were patches of orange and yellow they hadn't seen before. The man looked up the valley and imagined it all cloudy and rain-filled with the trees black and without leaves, and he thought about the spring and how so much had happened since he had come to this place. Walking out into the grass of the field, he spread his arms wide and turned his face to the sky, singing out a salutation to the high, clear sun. The next morning, before the woman had woke, the man went out walking down by the creek under a great canopy. Uh, that's not it. Um, uh, following, the very, following the very same path that led him to the meadow, he walked back to the teepee and started to pull its wooden pegs out of the ground. The next morning saw the clearing empty of the teepee, and in its place was a wide circle of dead grass, in the middle of which lay another circle, this one made by the stones of the fire pit. Already the rains the man had known would come pattered into the ashes, sending up little spurts as they fell. It was truly autumn now, the leaves blowing to the ground with each gust of wind, leaving more and more of the branches bare. The man and the woman had gone, taking with them the poles and the skin and all that had lay inside the teepee, and as they rounded a bend of the valley and their meadow dropped out of sight, the woman started a quiet crying, and the man put his down his load and came back, gathering her in his arms. And soon he too was weeping, looking over her shoulder back up the ridge above the valley. And they stood there together for a time, their eyes roaming over all that lay about them, their faces lit with smiles, tears flowing. The sun had dropped low and caught bright red against the top of every tree. The light inched until even the tallest spears on the topmost bridge grew dark. And so it was that they left. There you go. So this is a poem about timing. Do the elk move clockwise or counterclockwise around Cascade Head? What is their timing? The bear, the mountain lion, their timing is mostly set probably by their stomachs. 
the eagles, they sit in their nest, they come out, they fly, they hunt, they grab their prey with their claws, it's all in the timing. And then there's the salmon. Oh, the salmon. They have to figure out when to go to the ocean, when to come back, and how long to stay in the ocean. But today, we gather as kindred spirits to honor these two beautiful souls in the 50th anniversary, which happens to be 18,250 days of being together.